Greetings and welcome to Ever Present. I'm Pastor Michael Mira, and these are my friends. I'm Savannah James. I'm John Spellman. Do you uh, struggle with children who make the wrong choice? Have your young ones gone in the wrong direction? Parenting can be a very difficult job in this world, and uh, sometimes we struggle with young people who leave the church. Uh, churches have had experiences where they've had young people grow up in the church, they were nurtured in the church, they were ministered into the church, and at a certain point in time everyone has to make their own choice. And sometimes people stray, they go away from the faith that they were brought up in. Uh, today we're going to be speaking about parenting. How, how, what are some lessons? Does God have a message for parents? God cares about parents, and God cares about parenting. Ultimately, God is the ultimate parent. And on today's episode of Ever Present, we are going to speak about God's presence in parenting and in our relationship with our young ones, with our children. Uh, are there any instances in the Bible that will teach us how to respond, for example, to children who may, might not be disciplined, uh, may be defiant. Parenting is very difficult, you know, because it's not just the, the parent that is influencing their child. Oftentimes they're influenced by many other sources coming from outside in the world around us. We're going to look in particular today at the story of Eli and his sons. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we study the account of Eli and his sons, Hophni and Phinehas, help us to discern the principles from your word on parenting. We know that you are ever-present with us. We know we live in a difficult world. We know that the enemy of souls is seeking to go after the young ones, the children, the next generation, through the TV, through schools, through peer pressure, through many influences and through many channels, the enemy of souls is working to indoctrinate and to draw young people away from you, Heavenly Father. But we here at Ever Present have a burden today. We want to, to, to speak with parents. We want to speak about parenting and, and speak in general about raising up godly offspring as you have called us to do Heavenly Father. Help us, Lord God, to speak the truth in love and help those who are listening today uh, to be blessed by the message that we're going to discuss here today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So uh, all of us here on the panel are parents. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And, and so we, uh, we all know how difficult it can be. <laughs> And so uh, we're not we're not speaking uh, just purely theoretically, but let's see what the Bible has to say. Let's go to the book of First Samuel, chapter two, and let's begin reading uh, from First Samuel chapter two, from twelve to seventeen. Okay, First Samuel two, the uh, my Bible has a little uh, subheading there called the. Wicked sons of Eli. So, who would like to begin reading? I can read it. Um, now, the sons of Eli were sons of Bilial. They knew not the Lord. And the priest's custom with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant came while the flesh was in, was in seething with a flesh hook of, with, of three teeth in his hand. And he struck it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot all that the flesh hook brought up to, uh, brought up the priest took for himself so they did in shiloh unto unto all the israelites that came thither also before they burnt the fat the priest servant came and said to the man that sacrificed give flesh to roast for the priest for he will not have sodden flesh of thee but raw and if any man said, uh, said unto him, let, not, let them not fail to burn the fat presently, and then take as much as, thou, uh, as thy soul desireth, then he would answer him, Nay, but thou shalt give it me now, and if not, I will take it by force. Wherefore the sin of the young men was very great before the Lord, for, the men, for, for men abhorred the offering of the Lord. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
Okay, so we, we're looking here, it might not make a lot of sense, but just very, very basically, these, uh, these sons of Eli were being unfaithful to God in their service as priests. There was, so the, these two sons of Eli, um, when a priest conducted the ceremonies, there were certain things they were supposed to do, certain portions that they were supposed to eat. Everything was to be done a certain way. Mm -hmm. Not that you know, that just like when we think back on, uh, on Cain and Abel, you know, God had called for an offering. And the offering of Cain was not satisfactory to God. Abel's offering was satisfactory. God has a specific way to do things. If we come to church and, and the, the Bible says, you know, remember the Sabbath day, but we say, no, I'm going to go to church on another day. I'm going to go any, any day I want. Uh, you know, when we begin to alter the commandments of God, when we begin to alter the standards of God in order to, to please ourselves, to please our own appetite, um, that's a dangerous thing. We're not supposed to do that. And that's kind of what was going on yeah. uh, with the, the sons of Eli. Uh, Hophni and Phineas with their names, and they were not being faithful. They were being selfish. Yes, they were. You know, you might be a godly parent, you might uh, be on fire for the Lord, mm -hmm. going to church, studying. Mm -hmm. I know John studies sometimes all night. <laughs> <laughs> but just because you're on fire for the Lord doesn't mean your children are going to be. Mm -hmm. You know, you can't just say, well, uh, I'm going to transfer. You, you pray for your children, try to raise up godly offspring. But just because a parent is on fire for the Lord, you, you might, your parents might have been the founders of the church where you attend. That doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to be on fire. And I think that that happens to be one of the most frustrating things for parents because nothing is more frustrating to a godly parent than when you start to realize that your children take absolutely no interest mm. in church. And, you know, you wonder, okay, well, you know, what could I have done differently yeah. that would have changed the faith of my children? And so, you know, Eli, we have to imagine that um, he was a person who was a faith, you know, but he, he was a person who, who believed in God. Uh, and, and we see that, uh, as we'll see later on with Samuel, he does a pretty decent job of raising Samuel, but his own two biological sons, for some reason, mm. uh, they decide to go a different path. And yeah. so uh, one of the things I think that you have to accept as a parent is the same thing that God has to accept of us, mm. which is the idea of freedom of choice. choice yes. Because you can, if you think about the fact that, you know, maybe you might be the perfect parent, not saying that you are, but let's say, for example, if you were the perfect parent, and your, and your children can still turn out wayward. Yeah. It doesn't necessarily mean that you did something wrong. It right. could also be because the children just have freedom of choice. In the same way, God is the perfect parent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet, because we have the freedom to choose, even it, though God is the perfect parent and does everything right, mm -hmm. I mean, we can't, as, as, as good of a parent as we might be, we can't outdo God. Right. So as good as, uh, as, a, as of a parent as God is, still, people choose to go wayward and not accept his love. Mm. So you can't overlook the freedom of choice of the child. Yeah. All you can do is prepare them to make the right decision. Mm -hmm. But in the same way, most times we're not perfect parents. No. And it's because of compromises that we make that lead to our children choosing a different path. Mm. Mm. Yeah. What do you think about that, Savannah, about uh, what John was saying? Yeah, that's true. We we do have uh, to be parents, but the kids do have the final decision to make. The choices that they make would not necessarily be the choices that we might want them to make, but they have the choice. Mm -hmm. yeah, they got to choose. You know, sometimes a parent may be more interested in being a friend mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. a parent. Um, now it's always good to be friendly with your children, but there ha it has to be clear, uh, I'm your parent. Yeah. I'm your parent. Because sometimes uh, when a parent wants to be a friend to their child, you, may, you might not be able to do your ministry as a parent to the child, because now the child is looking at you as though, well, you're a, you're a friend. Yeah. You know, you, you can't, your, your word is equal to mine, and uh, you're, you're, you have no authority over mm -hmm. me. But the Bible is clear. God has given authority. Mm -hmm. God has given authority. And um, 
it's hard for people to appreciate that um, because we don't want to force people to right. do things and even in our day and age the word authority has become a negative word mm -hmm. the word hierarchy but the Bible points to a hierarchy in the family um, the Bible points to a hierarchy in heaven mm -hmm. That's right. uh, even though Jesus it w was the, the teacher even though he was a master um, he was the head and he's the head of the church but at the same time he washed the disciples feet now we appreciate when we read that story, the humbleness of Jesus, mm -hmm. but it doesn't mean there's no hierarchy. Mm -hmm. um, Jesus is God, still a hierarchy. And, and I think one of the hardest things for some people to accept, often because of the fault of a parent, is that authority can be a good thing. Yeah. You know, often we're trained to go against authority. We're trained to mm -hmm. uh, rebel and, and to and to disregard or dislike right. authority. And it's because those who are in authority have let us down. Right. And so if you're a person who is a parent and, you're, and you want your kids to obey your authority, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, Confucius taught was most important is filial piety, meaning the respect that one has for their parents. Because if one doesn't respect to, if, if one doesn't learn respect for their parents, yeah. then they can't possibly learn respect for anything else, including right. the secular government. Right. So he always taught that leaders should lead by example. And so if you're a parent, it's not just to be an authoritarian over your child, mm -hmm. but to lead by example. You should be exactly. exemplary in your behavior so that your, your, your kids see something that they can look up to. Children right. need role models. They might not know it, they might not admit mm -hmm. to it, but they, need, but they need role models. Yeah, and some yeah. parents would say, okay, do as I say, but don't do as I do. Oh, but right. you set in the wrong example for them to follow. Because the kids look at you. They're like sponges. They see everything, they know everything. And if you're going to do something that you don't want them to do, but you tell them don't do it, then you're not doing the right thing as a parent. You're not right. teaching them right. the right way. Right. Uh, so children, they look at, they, they don't just look at what we say, they look at what we do. Mm -hmm. And so we have to lead by example. Very important. That's how Jesus led. Jesus led by example. Let's take a look here at uh, 1 Samuel 2, 18. Okay, so here it says, But Samuel ministered before the Lord, even as a child, wearing a linen ephod. Okay, moreover, his mother used to make him a little robe and bring it to him year by year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. And Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say the Lord give you descendants from this woman for the loan that was given to the Lord then they would go to their own homes and the Lord visited Hannah so that she conceived and bore three sons two daughters meanwhile the child Samuel grew before the Lord so before the Lord is another way of talking about in the tabernacle of the Lord. We see that before the Lord repeatedly, for example, in the book of uh, Leviticus. Um, one passage that comes to mind with that before the Lord is seen in Leviticus chapter 4. I know this is an off note, John. I'm, I'm deviating just slightly. Am, no am problem. I allowed to do that? <laughs> okay. So let, let me just want to show what this is before the Lord. Um, uh, Exodus, Leviticus. Okay, so here we see Leviticus uh, chapter 4. Leviticus chapter 4. Can you read verse um, 6 and 7? And the priest shall dip his finger in the blood. Am I reading right thing? Yeah. And sprinkle of the blood seven times before the Lord, before the veil of the sanctuary. And the priest shall put some of the blood upon the horns of the altar of the sweet incense before the Lord, which is in the tabernacle of the congregation and shall pour all the blood of the bullock at the bottom of the altar of the burnt offering, which is at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So you can see the way that before the Lord were used in, in that passage, and it's used in many of the, of the chapters before it concerning the burnt offering and killing the bull before the Lord. Mm -hmm. um, and in chapter, uh, this chapter, chapter 3, 
this repetition of before the Lord, uh, sprinkling the blood seven times uh, before the Lord, before the veil. The veil was in the it's dividing the holy from the most holy place in the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. The altar of incense was before the Lord, again, in the sanctuary. So before the Lord, when it's saying here um, that... Um, Samuel grew before the Lord. He was in the sanctuary. He was ministering mm -hmm. in the sanctuary of God. Let's read from verse 22 to 25. I just wanted to make a point here yes. about the, about um, Eli and his, and his sons. Mm -hmm. You see, Eli was a, was a faithful priest, but the problem that Eli had was that you know when he allowed his sons to, uh, to get to that same position, uh, now they were ministering, but they didn't have the faith that he had, mm -hmm. which shows that, see, that's what's called nepotism, when people inherit positions based on who their parents are. Right. So in other words, I don't get the position because I earned it because somebody, you know, gave me an interview and hired me for the job. Mm -hmm. I get it because my mom is the head or yeah, my father is the head. And since, I'm, <laughs> since they're the head, then I automatically get the job. Yeah. And this story, I think, illustrates the problem with giving your children responsibilities that they're not really ready for. Mm. When you give a person or your child uh, you know, a responsibility that they're not ready for, and you make them the head or the lead of something, the problem then becomes if they're not passionate about it the way that you are, mm -hmm. then you know, they can completely bring it to ruin. And I think wow. that's why Solomon writes about how uh, you know, good people leave inheritance to their children, mm -hmm. but if a fool inherits a, a large sum of wealth, they might squander it. Yeah. So you don't know that you, you might have spent your whole life, um, you know, building up a massive empire of wealth, but you don't know if the person coming after you is going to squander it and if mm -hmm. it becomes nothing. And that's one of the things that he called vanity or a vexation of spirit right. because you can't control how passionate your children are going to be about something. So it shows you, as a parent, if you know that your children are not passionate about what you're passionate about, you probably don't want to give them certain types of responsibilities mm -hmm. if they're going to make shipwreck of it. Right. And I find it too, like if you allow the kid to work towards getting something, they appreciate it more than when you just give it to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So as it, parents, we should yeah. encourage them to work towards a goal and to encourage them to accomplish stuff on their own instead of just freely giving them everything they want. Exactly, yeah. Yes. Um, and, and just to explain what was going on here, when the people were offering up their sacrifices, Hophni and Phineas were basically, see, normally you would have to give a, the burnt offering before the Lord, as you mm -hmm. were explaining before, mm -hmm. and the whole entire thing would be sacrificed. And then only what was left over would be given to the priest. What Hophni and Phineas were doing were taking the best parts for themselves, for themselves and leaving the leftover for God. Mm -hmm. So they were actually getting fat and getting um, you know, uh, wealthy off of the things that, the, that they were being, that were being sacrificed mm -hmm. and leaving only the bare minimum for God. Right. Um, so people's sacrifices were being really essentially given to the priests as opposed to being offered to God. Mm -hmm. And that's why they began to despise the sacrifices uh, because they felt that they were just being taken advantage of. Mm -hmm. Well, let's continue here. We were having a good uh, discussion about parenting and looking at Eli and his sons. And uh, let's, look, let's continue reading the account from 22 to 25. Okay. Uh, anybody can... Now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel and how they laid with the woman that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Mm. And he said unto them, Why do ye such things? For I hear of every evil dealings by all this people. 22 to 25. Nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear. Ye make the Lord's people to transgress. If one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father, because the Lord would slay them. Okay, so we say we see Hophni and Phineas uh, and the way they're behaving, but then in 26 we see that Samuel grew in stature and in favor both with the Lord and men. Mm -hmm. So we see a comparison between Eli's biological right. sons and Samuel, mm -hmm. but look what it said here that. Uh, 
that uh, Eli's sons were laying with the women. Mm -hmm. So they, they were really uh, wicked. Wicked to everything. <laughs> yeah. Not only are you taking all their sacrifices, but you're also sleeping with their <laughs> Encouraging daughters. Encouraging them and, to sin. You know, and so forth. Yeah. So, I mean, this is really, really shocking what was going on here. Very, very uh, perverse and, mm -hmm. and what they were doing. Um, and going in before the Lord and ministering before the Lord mm. and doing these things. So they made a joke yeah. of, the, of the, the work of the Lord. Wow. And today we kind of see some similar things happening. I mean, aren't there some pastors whose children may act in this way? And everybody has a tendency to uh, speak negatively about the pastor. But yeah. what we see from this story is that the pastor could be actually doing his job. Right. But the children also have a choice. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, there are some times when, let's say, you know, the, the pastor may not be raising the children rightly. Mm -hmm. But in this case, it doesn't really give us an indication that Eli uh, misguided his sons right. in the sense that he uh, endorsed this, mm -hmm. but rather that this is what they chose to do. And so it doesn't matter how spiritual a person might be, mm -hmm. the children can make their own choice to go astray. Mm -hmm. But then the fault then comes back to Eli in, okay, now that you see that this is what your children are doing, what do you do about it? Yeah. And, and yes, right. Like, yeah. When you look at Samuel too, he came to the temple at a very young age. Mm -hmm. So knowing that his mom or dad taught him very well at home first before they brought him into the temple. So he mm -hmm. was like a good example as being a son who's been the text that say train up a child in the way he should grow. Mm -hmm. Samuel was one of those. Mm. Amen. Amen. This is very important. We have to keep these principles in mind. They're important for raising up godly offspring. And um, we see in this uh, area that we just read from 22 to 25 that Eli, he tried to steer his sons in the right direction, at least as what we, we see here. Mm -hmm. um, but ultimately, it, it, didn't, um, it didn't bear out. No. Um, let's continue reading from verse 26. And let's go to well, yes. Go to verse twenty-six. Yeah, was what Eli did enough? That's that's the question. Now, I on a practical I, level, it, yeah. it wasn't on a practical level because they obviously they didn't change. Right. What I, what I mean by that is okay. He says to them, you know, what you're doing is not good. Mm -hmm. If one person sins against another, the judge will judge him. But if a man sins against the Lord, who's right. going to entreat for him? Mm -hmm. So nothing was wrong with what Eli said. He, he told his sons the right thing. Hey, mm -hmm. you guys are doing the wrong thing. You know, this isn't something that God is going to appreciate. Right. Right. But he took, it says here that they, 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 they hearkened not to the voice of their father. Mm -hmm. um, and what's also interesting is that Eli did nothing further right. to restrain his sons, and mm -hmm. certainly he had the ability to, from his position mm -hmm. as the head priest. Yeah, um, he could have removed them from position. He could have said, "No, this isn't going to continue." He could have put a stop to it. But I guess we can get from this story that, in some sense, Eli made compromises and overlooked what his children were doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so th I think this is a message to us today as parents, where if we're in a position to do something about what our children choose to do wrong, that there are times when we have to take action. Right. There are times not to. But then there are times when we should, when it's within our power to do so. Mm -hmm. And yeah. when the children are basically using us as the means by which they do what's wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we could apply this even beyond raising children. We could, we could apply this, for example, to the church, pastors. You know, we have a conference. Mm -hmm. And let's say it's known that there's a pastor who doesn't believe in the doctrine. Right. Doesn't believe in the doctrine. And it's known by the leadership. This mm -hmm. person doesn't believe in the doctrine. Mm -hmm. And they say to, the, to this pastor, you know, uh, uh, you, know uh, you should believe in the doctrine. Mm -hmm. But they still let him go on right. pastoring. Yeah, that's crazy. You know, this, yeah, is, yeah. this is not, uh, this is, again, we can mm -hmm. relate. You know, here's somebody with the authority to do something about it. Mm -hmm. Like Eli had the authority right. and uh, doesn't do anything about it. Just says he some just of the right things. said but, something and yeah. didn't really yeah. take action. I mean, he action. got commend him for at least saying something, yeah. but he took, he took no, no further action. action. He, didn't, yeah. he didn't put a stop to it, and it was within his ability to do so. Yeah. And he could have here. saved his kids from the tragedy that happened. Yes. Right. Yes. yes. But yes. because of him not being stern enough. Yeah. And, and then it, it begs the question, when we choose to be silent or to overlook the things that our children do, what kinds of tragedy might befall them mm. because we keep silent and we don't say what needs to be said? Mm. Yeah. I mean, if you look in the case of Eli, if he had removed his sons from that position, 
it, they might have not liked being removed from that position, but it may have saved their life mm -hmm. to be removed from mm -hmm. that position. Maybe in the case of a pastor who is teaching false doctrines and uh, nobody wants to remove him and they leave him there, you know, that's a, that's a stressful situation. If you believe one thing, the church believes another, that's not a healthy thing. And it may right. actually do physical harm to leave a pastor in a position like that. You may mm -hmm. be better off removing them. Yeah. Got a comment coming in here. It says, uh, Eli trusted his kids too much mm -hmm. as opposed to actually being a, a true steward. Uh, he seemed to have a laissez-faire attitude and did not seek to correct their waywardness. Mm -hmm. Yes, the children can choose to go astray, but what kind of relationship did he have with his kids as children? Mm -hmm. uh, did they respect him and his authority? Mm -hmm. Obviously, he did. They did. It doesn't look like they no. did. It doesn't look like it. It's interesting. And point, the question yeah. is why? The question is why didn't they respect Eli? So let's let's continue. Maybe we'll see what happened. Let's read from twenty-seven to thirty-six. Okay, this is important. Twenty-seven to thirty-six. There came a man of God. Am I reading? Yeah, was it 20? Wait, did we read 26 yet? Oh, yeah, I read that one earlier. That okay. said, you know, Samuel grew yeah. in stature and favor both the, uh, with the Lord and men. Okay. okay. And there came a man of God unto Eli and said unto him, Thus said the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest? to offer upon my, <coughs> excuse me, my altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephron before me, and did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by the fire <coughs> of the children of Israel? Excuse me. Up to 29, you said? Uh, uh, 36. Wherefore, kick ye or at my sacrifice and at my offering which I have commanded in my habitation and honorest thy son above me to make yourself fat with the chief chiefest of all the offerings of Israel my people wherefore the Lord God is of Israel said I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever but now the Lord said be it far from me for them that honor me, I will honor, and they that despise me shall light, shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days come that I will cut off thine arm, and the arm of thy father's house, that there shall not be an old man in thy house, and thou shalt see an enemy in my habitation, in all the wealth which God shall give Israel, and there shall not be an old man in thy house forever. And the man of thine, whom I shall not cut off from my altar, shall be to consume thine eyes, and to grieve thine heart, and all the increase of thine house shall die in the flower of their age. And this shall be a sign unto thee, that shall come upon the two sons, on Hophni and Phinehas, in one day they shall die, both of them. And I will raise me up a faithful priest, for shall that shall do according to that which is in my heart and in my mind and I will build him a sure house and he shall walk before mine anointed forever and it shall come to pass that everyone that is left in thine house shall come and crouch to him for a piece of silver and a muscle of bread and shall say put me I pray thee into one of the priest's office that I may eat a piece of bread Okay, so so here we see that a man of God comes to Phineas, and we see, uh, rather to Eli, Eli a man yeah. of God comes to, to, so a prophet comes to Eli, and really uh, lets Eli have it, mm -hmm. lets him hear some things wow. mm -hmm. that he needs to hear, and sometimes someone from outside of your family may come and tell you, you know, your children are not behaving correct, they mm -hmm. might have to say... And a lot of times we don't welcome that. We don't want anybody no. to tell us that kind of thing. That usually doesn't yeah. go over well, especially no. in the church setting. Yeah. If somebody exactly. says, Very you know, hey, your children are misbehaving, you know, some, a parent usually will get defensive Very rather defensive. than take it yes. to heart. Yes. And what's interesting, I, I found two things interesting about verse 29. Mm -hmm. The first part where it says, wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice mm -hmm. and at my offering. So if we as parents do not demonstrate the proper decorum 
with holy things, then our children will not learn to respect and reverence holy things. Sure. So it's important that even from a very young age, we need to teach our children respect and reverence mm -hmm. for things that are holy. Right. And in the church setting, I mean, obviously we don't have the temple like they did back then, mm -hmm. but in the church setting, that means respect and reverence for you know the pulpit or respect and reverence for you know the divine hour or yeah. you know for when the sermon is, is going on. Uh, we need to be reverent ourselves and mm -hmm. model for our children um, respect of holy things mm -hmm. and also enforce that they respect and treat those things as holy right. because when we allow children to just do whatever they want I mean like in some churches you always have that group of kids that's out in the hallway mm -hmm. and uh, you know you're always wondering like okay well where are the parents but yeah. you dare not say anything to the children <laughs> because you know if you say something the parent is going to go off yeah, you know and yeah. you, you want to tell the children come on inside you know this is where you hear the word of God but the parents don't ever think to get up and go out there and get the kids mm -hmm. because they're lucky enough to have them there yeah. so a lot of times parents have that <laughs> right, mindset right, right, where it's right, like right, right. I at don't want to pick to too many battles <laughs> yeah. because I'm lucky enough that the child has at least come yeah. right, but the right. problem that we're, that we're facing right. here is that when we don't teach our kids how to respect holy things mm -hmm. they never learn and the second thing that I saw here is that God says in the second part of the verse, yes. and honors thy sons mm -hmm. above me. Yeah. There are times mm -hmm. when for peace sake with our children, we actually honor our children rather mm -hmm. than honoring God. Mm -hmm. yes. You know, your children may be putting up a fight with you about going to church or mm -hmm. about, you know, praying or doing family worship or whatever it might be. And when you give in to that and you allow your children to make that, that kind of decision for you, when you listen to the complaining and so forth and you decide not to reinforce these values within your children, then it can get to the point where you can be honoring your children and respecting their wishes mm -hmm. rather than God's wishes. Right. And the right. problem with doing that is that as they grow older, having never learned to respect God, then they can put themselves in a, in a, at a great disadvantage. Yeah. Yes. I yes. mean, imagine, you know, you've done the things that you know you need to do and perhaps you're, you're ready to make it to the kingdom. But then imagine that when you get there, your children aren't mm. there. Yes. I mean, yes. and because you didn't prepare them, mm. because you made compromises in order to appease them yeah. rather than teaching them what's right. There are times when we can't, like you said before, we can't be our children's friends because when we are not, when, when we try to be our children's friends, sometimes we don't teach them the proper principles mm. by which they have to live. Right. That's right. And that's what we see going on here. Mm -hmm. uh, Eli, first of all, uh, was kicking at the sacrifice and allowing his children to do this uh, rather than reinforcing what how, how God's holy things should be treated. Mm -hmm. And secondly, by allowing this to happen and not restraining these kids, he was honoring his sons above, above, above God. Mm -hmm. He was basically allowing his kids to do whatever they wanted. They did as they pleased. And um, he, he was willing to be at odds with God mm -hmm. rather than at odds with his own children. And today, sometimes parents make similar decisions where you don't want a fight in your household, so you yes. honor your children or you honor yes. your spouse yes. above God. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's yeah. right. Amen. Mm -hmm. These are some very real lessons. Very real lessons that um, people are struggling with. Yep. And we're not here to, to sit here as though we don't struggle with these <laughs> things ourselves. We're speaking right. as we human beings. Yep. We're not ho holding ourselves up and saying no. we're perfect. Nope. But we want to all point to the Bible. Mm -hmm. So we're not pointing to ourselves, pointing to the, to the Word of God. And what else do we see here? Uh, it also says, to make yourselves fat. Mm -hmm. To make yourselves fat. Mm -hmm. is, uh, that yourself sounds like Eli, Eli too. Eli, yes. Do you think? Yes. Yeah, it does. Uh, that is Eli he's talking about there. Yeah. Um, and, and what's interesting, um, just, just to grab that part of the verse again, it, it basically is suggesting that while... The two, the two men were, were taking the choicest parts of the offering, Eli was benefiting from it also. Yes. Mm. So if not only are you allowing your children to compromise, but you're doing it too mm -hmm. because yeah. you want to appease them, mm -hmm. now you have a situation that's even worse. And my question is, well, today, are parents doing the same thing? Mm. Yeah. Obviously not with the offerings because we don't offer up burnt right. offerings in the church, right? Mm -hmm. But in some ways, aren't we doing the same thing? Mm -hmm. If we allow our children to bring cell phones and iPads and tablets to church, Mm -hmm. And during the church service, while the Maybe pastor is preaching, they're on there watching Batman or movies or whatever it might be. Uh, and you're there, right, rather than listening to the pastor, you watching it with them. Yeah. yeah. At some point, you're, you're, making the same, you're making compromises alongside your children rather than guiding them down the right path mm -hmm. because you don't want to argue with them. Yes. I mean, a lot of times people make, make decisions to do the wrong thing because they love their children. But sometimes in the act of loving your children, 
you can actually do what's wrong for them mm -hmm. rather than what's right for them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there's, you know, you have to do what's right by your children, even if at first they're not going to appreciate it. Mm. Well, we see later on as we continue to study in this account um, that actually because Eli was overweight, and we saw in this passage uh, that it said here, make yourselves fat. Mm -hmm. And Eli was, as far as uh, just a straightforward reading of that, Eli was included in that, in that making yourselves fat. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know what it was like, but I could imagine, you know, maybe one of the sons walking around eating a piece of meat, and then the father saying, you know, you're not supposed yeah, to do that. Let me try a little of that. <laughs> <laughs> <I know. Yeah>, right. <laughs> we got uh, two comments that just came in here. Uh, one says, we can't allow kids to get away with respecting holy things and authority because in uh, the end, they end up not respecting anything. This mm -hmm. is what uh, was seen in Eli's sons. They didn't respect God, so, uh, so they couldn't respect any laws or precepts. Mm -hmm. The second comment says we can't allow kids to get. Wait, actually, um, no, I'm sorry, that was the same same comment. Mm -hmm. That was the same one. Okay. Yeah, same comment. So anyway, um, we see that we're going to see later on that Eli's heaviness, physical heaviness, actually played a part as as we read in, mm -hmm. in his in his demise. Mm -hmm. um, let's we'll see that in chapter four, but let's look at chapter three and let's read verse thirteen. Okay, what does this say? First uh, Samuel three, thirteen. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knows, because his sons made themselves vile. Okay, so mm -hmm. Eli's sons did what? Made themselves vile. Made themselves vile, and he did restrain not them. restrain them. He Eli did not so restrain them. Sometimes say that over there, right? It's, I mean, it's a hard thing. I mean, a parent sometimes will be faced. I mean, as we talk about bad decisions and children going their own way and becoming young people, sometimes a parent will be put in a position where either they're going to have to uphold the Word of God or maybe they're going to lose their kids. Do you think that Eli probably was so busy that he really didn't pay much attention to his kids? Do you think he was so busy wrapped up into doing everything for the Lord in the temple that he really didn't spend that quality time with the kids that's why they it's did interesting that. you say that because that's been one of the observation with pastors children I'm a pastor I have children I you know I'm continually praying for guidance with that but that's one of the things they say with the uh, the way that it uh, and you know people have observed in in many cases in numerous cases the children of pastors behaving worse mm -hmm. than the other kids in the congregation mm -hmm. and um, you know the people have wrestled with why that is that's one of the conclusions that people have come to. You know, mm -hmm. the, ch the child grows up in a home where the pastor is so uh, interested in the church and doing church work and dealing mm -hmm. with church matters, and you know, and the child is seeing the pastor doing all of these things and giving all their attention to those things and none of the attention to the to them. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, they may even witness the church disrespecting their 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 right. their, their parent. You know the pastor, mm -hmm. and they see that, and they and then they get d angry at the church. Yes. So it could be, you know, those yeah. those things could happen. Yeah, you know, those things could Good happen. Point. Hmm. And so, um, you know, we we're seeing here as we saw the prophet coming and speaking plain words, but speaking the truth in love. That's what a, a, any prophet of God does. They speak the truth in mm -hmm. love even though it's difficult, mm -hmm. speaking clearly to Eli, telling him, you know, he, you, you, your kids are out of control, Eli. Yeah. Your kids are out of control. It was a case, you know, that I heard about um, where kids were out of control in the church and somebody ha wanted to say something, but they were afraid that the parents were going to yell at them. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes, you know, parents, sometimes they, they don't want to hear what needs to be yeah. needs to be heard yes you yeah. might and deal my, with that as a, in of your, course yes yeah, an work. educator definitely and, and the problem is uh, i'll tell you right now the problem is that when you start to ignore what people tell you about your children mm -hmm. when they're right it's different mm -hmm. when somebody's nitpicking but when you know that what the person's telling you is right and you ignore what people tell you about what your children are doing then the problem becomes that you begin to enable them to yes. do it yeah. and if you don't ever check what's going on and you, and you continue to enable children in doing the wrong thing, mm -hmm. then it becomes a habit. And when it becomes a habit, it's hard to break it. And when it becomes a part of their character, then over time, 
those are going to be things that lead them down worse paths mm -hmm. later on in their lives. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if, if um, you tell your children that uh, you know they need to listen when you tell them to do something, and mm -hmm. they never and they never listen to you, then down the line, what's going to happen when they're on the job? And they're not accustomed to being told to do something. Yeah. And the boss says, I want this done at this time. And they say, no, I'm not doing it by that time. And they end up getting fired. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or they can't hold the job. Yeah. So the, the, the habits that we um, cultivate in our children now will play a much greater role later on in the future. Mm -hmm. And so we have to understand that if we enable children to learn bad habits, then those things can be costly. And when I say costly, I'm not just talking about in the spiritual sense, because obviously it would be costly in their relationship with God. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it's also costly in a practical, uh, worldly, mm -hmm. um, that's what I'm looking for, a, a, a practical worldly environment as well. Mm -hmm. Because um, when, when they develop bad habits, I mean, people find it difficult to hire employees that are trustworthy. Mm -hmm. And it's because people have developed bad habits uh, yeah. as children. Yeah. So we have to keep that in mind. If, if people are telling you things about your children that you know are true mm -hmm. and that they're not really intending to pick on your kid, but they're just telling you and bringing things to your attention, you should listen because yeah. it's better to correct those habits yeah. ahead of time yeah. rather than later. And you know, in my capacity as a teacher, um, you know, obviously you have to be very careful about how you put things to a parent. Mm -hmm. you, know, you start off with something positive and you know, then you get into whatever it was that was done. You know, you don't want to make it seem... But the biggest thing for parents, in my experience, is that, number one, they want to know that you care about their kid. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. The second thing is they want to know that um, not only do you care about their kid and have their best interest at heart, but that you're not picking on them. Mm -hmm. You're not singling them out. Right. And then, once they know that you're not trying to do those two things, then generally they'll be receptive. So when you put something across to a parent, you have to put it across in a way that shows them that you care about the child, first of all, because that's what we do. Mm -hmm. We want them to stay in the church. We don't want them to be just, right. you know, yelled at and that's the end of it. No, we want them to stay. <laughs> we want them to grow up to be successful because mm -hmm. they're our future. But at the same time, you want to also talk about how to correct that behavior. Yeah. Because if we don't correct the behavior, it's going gonna, it's gonna to form problems not only for uh, the child's spiritual life, but the child's practical secular living as well mm -hmm. and not only for the children for the parents also the parents have the um they what was the word i'm looking for they suffer through the stuff that the kids do because mm -hmm. you don't just sit there and say oh yeah my kid's just doing that i don't care it hurt it hurts you inside to see what your kid doing like when you see them doing something wrong mm. yeah but i mean i think that the point that you were making earlier is that the greater hurt is gonna come when you ignore that behavior, you enable the child, and then later on you pay for it because that child has become accustomed to making those, you know, the, to performing those habits. Mm -hmm. And now they're at an age where they don't desire to change and you don't and you're starting to lose your influence over them. Yeah. Right. You know, so you wanna be able to correct these behaviors ahead of time while you still have the influence because if you don't do it now, it's gonna cost later on in so many different ways. Yeah, and another point that has to be mentioned as well is in uh, the, the principle in Matthew five, three through uh, Matthew seven rather Matthew seven three through five, mm. which is about taking a plank out of your own eye before mm -hmm. you take the speck in someone else's eye. You don't want to go and tell yeah. somebody's parent, you know, your, your kids are out of control if your own kids are out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. not doing. Yeah. So we we always have to remember to apply these uh, principles to ourselves as well. Yeah. Two comments just came in. Yes. Uh, society nowadays has an issue in general with children being left to raise themselves yeah. as parents are focused on their careers, particularly persons like pastors, teachers, doctors, nurses, etc., who spend a lot of time giving and taking care of others. The kids at times will start to rebel at times just to get attention of mm. the parents. Parenting is, is one of the hardest roles that we are charged with. Mm -hmm. And the second okay. comment, no matter how hard it may be, we have to correct our children and make sure that they show respect for the things of God and people around them. We are literally saving their lives and our, and our hearts honestly. Mm -hmm. If something happens to them because of waywardness, uh, how, how would we feel? Being the one who is supposed to bring them up in a, in a straight and narrow way so that uh, they cannot be harmed from wrongdoing. Yeah, and in today's world, you know, obviously the, the ideal thing, and there is nobody who is ideal, all have sinned and fallen mm -hmm. short of the glory of God, but to have a godly mother and a godly father. Sadly, and our heart goes out to them, there are many children ro ra raised up in broken families or in, in, uh, 
in less than ideal circumstances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, a mother can't be a father. A father can't be a mother. And so it's a very, very painful and difficult situation Mm -hmm. when a parent has to try and um, take that burden on without having the other partner. And Mm -hmm. there's a lot of times where the where those things are happening too and um, you know and our heart goes out to them we have to pray for them and um, as a church we all have a part to play in the raising up of of godly offspring. Mm -hmm. Yeah you know and I I like the first comment that was made here is talking about how there are a lot of people who are at work they have to work they have to bring in that income Um, and and it's difficult to balance um, the, the job and also you know paying close attention to the needs of your children. Mm-hmm. Yes. And so yes. the thing is that, you know, we can only do what we can do. That's that's a that's a very true statement. Mm-hmm. But we have to use our time wisely and let and make sure that our children know what's important to us. So if you were to ask your children, it's just a little practical thing that I'm throwing out there. If you were to ask your children, what do you think is the most important thing to me? And when the child gives you an answer, if that answer has nothing to do with Christ, mm-hmm. nothing to do with God then it shows you what you have emphasized as most important to that child. So in the time that you do have to spend with them, make the time to show them how important God is in your life. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I highly recommend for all of the parents that are listening in right now is taking the time out for family worship. Yes, that's very important. Because if you take the time out for family worship, you're showing your children that God has to come first. Mm -hmm. Amen, yes. Now the second thing that I would say because of the reality of time let's not throw let's not pretend like that doesn't exist Mm -hmm. you know the reality of time uh takes a lot of things away from us so one of the things that i've learned and that i'm probably a a a, uh, practical example of is that sometimes what you can't do god provides through somebody else yes so if you're faithful what what you can do right right and what i mean by that is that sometimes god will send people into your life right that are his, that are chosen, that are that are spiritual. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And sometimes those people that God sends into your life can help you to do the things uh, and or to teach your children the things that perhaps you might not be around to, 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 uh, to teach them. Mm-hmm. Uh, as an example, my parents were both educators. My parents worked uh, full time, you know? So um, they sent me uh, to someone around the, the, the corner who happened to be a Christian. Mm-hmm. And that, uh, that person, uh, you know, raised me for much of my life because my parents were at work, mm-hmm. so much of the day I was with, with her, and right. I came to call her grandma. Mm-hmm. And through her teaching, I mean, she shared so much about the Bible with me, she would read Bible stories with me, she taught me about Bible principles, she taught me about uh, you know so many different things. And any question that I had about the Bible, she had an answer for. Mm-hmm. And it, I, I can honestly say I would not be here right now if it was not for her. Now my parents, you know, my parents, uh, my mom especially was a God-fearing person. Uh, you know, she wanted to take me to church, but again, there's only so much she could do. Mm-hmm. Uh, so there are times when God will send special people into your life uh, that can help you to have a godly influence over your children. Mm-hmm. And so if, if, you, if you're struggling to find the time, you know, pray. I mean, you got to do your part. Like we said, we, we, you know, we, we, there's no getting around that. Mm-hmm. You got to show your children that God is important to you. Because yes. if it's not important to you, then why should it be important to them? Mm-hmm. But at the same time, be on the lookout for somebody that God wants to send into your life who can do perhaps what you can't do. And mm-hmm. it takes a village to, wear, to, to raise a child. Um, and so the church has a responsibility in the raising of children, mm-hmm. not just the individual parents by themselves. Amen. Let's continue to work here. Um, and let's work through these passages in 1 Samuel 4. We will read from 10, okay, 10 to 18. 1 Samuel 4, 10 to 18. Maybe, John, you want to read that? Sure, 1 Samuel 10. Uh, 4, 10 to 18. And it says, And the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten. And they fled every man into his tent, and there was a very great slaughter, for for, uh, there fell of Israel 30,000 footmen. And the ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. And there ran a man of Benjamin out of the army and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes rent and with earth upon his head. And when he came, and when he came, lo, Eli sat upon a seat by the wayside watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the men came into the city and told it, and told it all the city cried out. 
And when Eli heard the noise of the crying, he said, What meaneth the noise of this tumult? And the man came in hastily and told Eli. Now Eli was ninety and eight years old, and his eyes were, were, were dim, and, and uh, that he could not see. And the man said unto Eli, I am he that came out of the army, and, and I fled to the, today out of the army. And he said, What is there done, my son? And the messenger answered and said, Israel is fled before the Philistines, and, and there hath, hath, hath been also a great slaughter among the people, and thy two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God is taken. And it came to pass, when he made mention of the ark of God, that he fell from, talking about Eli, he fell mm -hmm. from off, his, off the seat backward by the, by the side of the gate, and his neck break, mm -hmm. and he died, for he was an old man and heavy, and he had judged Israel forty years. Mm -hmm. Mm. So there we see the fate of um, Hophni and Phineas, and Phineas, and say they were slain and they were destroyed. They were there to protect the ark, but they were they were killed. Mm -hmm. And Eli himself fell backwards and died, and he broke his neck. And it made a point of mentioning the Bible always has a reason for mentioning what it does. Mm -hmm. Said he was old and heavy. He was heavy. And why was he heavy? Because the same offerings that they were taking. <laughs> and for themselves, <laughs> Eli was also eating. So the very thing that Eli was using, uh, the, the very sacrifices that Eli was feeding himself, uh, ended up being his death. Mm -hmm. Got a comment that just came in here. It says, sadly, this is what we see in today's culture society. The right to discipline children has been taken away from parents or guardians. Uh, for some, that is a way to shirk their responsibility. Priority is given to physical appearance and secularism, while spirituality is neglected. How do we reclaim our young ones from the world? Mm. Yeah, that's a very important point. And in, in many ways, it, there is an attack on parenthood. As we can see, there's an attack on the family. There's an attack on parenthood. And there are all these different avenues that Satan is going after the children. And the church is a family. The church is to be a family. That is what the church is supposed to be. But many times, the church itself doesn't function as a family. Mm -hmm. And as John was saying, sometimes a person comes to speak to a parent about some faults that they're seeing in their child, but maybe that person also has faults in his own child. Mm -hmm. Or maybe that person um, maybe that person doesn't show that he cares for the children, mm -hmm. you know. And so there isn't that, that um, communicating in love that yeah. happens. And so there are so many different factors, but we have to keep in mind what the Bible is saying, you know. There may be somebody who comes from outside of your family, a godly person, good intentions, cares about your children, or even if not a godly person. Yeah. I mean, let's be honest, sometimes a person might not be a godly yeah. person, but you know your children are behaving badly and they say something, but you don't want to hear it. Yeah. Um, we're learning from, the, from what we've been reading here about, um, about Eli, we, we learn that parents do have to have restraints on their children. Mm -hmm. You can't let them do whatever they mm -hmm. want. I think what's being asked here is more like in, in a practical sense, because remember our, si our society is saying, you know, if, you, if your kid curses and you smack them in the mouth, uh, <laughs> oh, you yeah. have now, now abused, you know, yeah. abused the child and now you, you have gone. Yes, that's you know? another. But the reality is that, you know, we need to do whatever we can as parents. And sometimes, as my mother used to say, you just got to get creative. Some, mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, you got to look, look. I mean, I, when I grew up, you know, uh, it was. Uh, I was raised the old-fashioned way. Let's just uh, <laughs> say that I was. And um, you know, yes, he's right. You know, in today's world, with the eye in the sky and everything's on mm -hmm. Facebook and everything, you, every little yes. thing can be televised, and, mm -hmm. and anything may be called abuse nowadays. And so, sometimes a parent feels yelling like at a thing. child is considered yeah. abuse, yeah. emotional, it's it's every kind of abuse, right? Yeah. There's emotional yeah. abuse, yeah. physical there's, abuse. There's uh, what else? Educational uh, neglect. Educational neglect. There are so many different categories of abuse now, mm -hmm. and, and in so many ways we see that um, the government is coming into the home, mm -hmm. you know, and That's a problem. these different, yeah. uh, these different, through these different avenues, um, we live in a, in a, in a world where uh, it's difficult to raise up godly offspring. Mm -hmm. not, when my, when yeah. my parents were young, they, my mom always told me that, maybe your mom told you that too, if your kid got out of uh, out of hand in the school the teacher would hit the, t the child mm -hmm. oh yeah and yeah. then and then you'd come home and you'd, you'd get it from your parents yeah. you didn't even want them to call your parents so yeah. today's world you know i remember years ago somebody uh kept calling me from the school 
and they were calling me looking for the parent of a child. I think the child gave them the wrong, the wrong number. number. So they kept calling my house and leaving messages on the phone. And you could hear this teacher. It was a teacher. And you could hear the teacher. You could hear all the kids screaming in the background. Mm. And the teacher was afraid of this student. Wow. And he was tr he was thinking he was calling the parents of the mm -hmm. students. He's saying, yeah. your son is this, your son is that. And right now he's looking at me like, I don't know what. <laughs> he said that on the phone. That's what he said. Yeah, so he was terrified of this. So there's, you know, we, we live in a world where there's no order anymore. Yeah. Our, our, uh, our society difficult. creates a situation where children get to do as they please mm -hmm. and they do what they want to do. Yes. And the problem with that is that, see, the, when, when you don't have the older generation to truly guide the younger generation, then you know you have complete chaos. Now mm -hmm. I want to just say that there's a difference between child abuse and discipline. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, we're not advocating for child abuse. Okay, that's that's not okay. Right. But there's a huge difference between that and discipline. You cannot let your children do whatever they want because it's not good for them. Yeah. And by doing it, if you if you allow children to do whatever they want to do, then it's going to lead to problems in the long run. They have to have somebody to 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 uh, to respect and look up to somebody that's dependable and somebody that set the right example. Mm -hmm. um, and so, when you're dealing with your children, whatever the issues might be, uh, the, just a few practical things that I recommend. Number one, you want to talk to your children. Mm -hmm. It might not seem like you're getting through right away. It might not seem like they're hearing anything you say, but trust me, it's sticking in there, and it'll come out at times when you least expect it. I mean, now as I raise my own daughter. I'm starting to see myself saying things that my parents said mm -hmm. that I thought I would never say. You know, um, so so one thing is talking I, to your I children. I thought you were a perfect child. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wish. <laughs> if only my mother could hear you say that. <laughs> but but one thing that I that I recommend, okay, talking to your child, don't just punish, mm -hmm. but explain why. Why? Yes. Okay. Uh, because as you as you as you communicate to them um, what you're trying to teach them. It might not register right away, but it will register down the line. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things I always got yelled at for as a kid, turning lights off. I never, I would keep the lights, all the lights in the house on all the time. <laughs> because if, as I move from room to room to room, mm -hmm. you know, I need to be able to see where I was going. So I wouldn't, you know, I did, I, my stepfather would say constantly, turn the lights off. Turn off. You want to pay the electric bill? Mm -hmm. But now, you I remember like the last time my stepfather came by <laughs> and he left the light on. I was like, hey, hey, you know, you left the lights on. He said, like, oh, so when you're paying for it, uh -huh. it makes a difference. But, so you see, like, Things that your parents say start to make sense later on. Mm -hmm. uh, so don't give up on talking to your children. It might it might seem like uh, it's not registering, but you never know the influence that you have. So keep talking to them. Mm -hmm. Secondly, that's your household. That's not their household. Mm -hmm. That's th that's your household. You pay the bills in that household. Okay. So when you say give me the phone, mm -hmm. or you say there's no TV. It is what you say because that's your household. You pay the bills. Your children are not entitled to cell phone use. They're not entitled to TV time. That's your household that you pay the mortgage on. When they pay the mortgage, they get to do what they want. When you're paying the mortgage, <laughs> you do. They do what you say. Yeah. Okay. They they, they got to do what you, what they're told because it's your household, and you have to remember that. Don't ever let your children convince you that that's not your household because that's when the power starts to shift. Yep. If it's your household, let it be your household. Hmm. What, if, you what if they the tell you it's not fair when you turn off the TV? <laughs> <laughs> tell life is fair. That's right. <laughs> you make up something. I don't know. You know but, but sometimes you, you can't be so worried about pleasing your children or, or being seen as that's favorable. Cool, there are times when you have to be seen as negative. You have to be seen... You, you, your children have to be allowed to get angry at you or, or, or to be um, somehow, uh, I'll just put it this way. Your children sometimes will have to be angry at you. There are going to be times when they don't like you. And that's okay because there are times when you got to make difficult decisions because it's the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. You know, So you can't be afraid to be viewed in an unfavorable light by your children. Mm -hmm. And then I would say like for the extreme cases, you got to be creative when it comes to punishments when your children refuse to listen. When you, mm -hmm. when you make it clear that you don't want something done and they still go and they do it, you got to let them have it. And that can mean different things depending on you know, where you are and your, what your circumstances are. Um, I can tell you one thing. Um, when I was in high school, I tell everybody this story, but when I was in high school, I made the, mis I made the mistake of uh, I did something I, or I said something I wasn't supposed to say around Christmas time. And my mother got tired of it. And so she put me on punishment, and when she put me on punishment, she took 
everything from my room. <laughs> See, people today, when you guys get grounded, you all don't get grounded like how I got grounded. She took everything from my room. I was only left with books. She took the TV out. She took the games out. She took the comic books. She took the toys. Everything was gone. And I had nothing to look at except for the blue walls of the room. Mm. Then I, I kept, I, I said something else uh, roughly around Christmas time. I don't remember what it was. Um, and um, she got tired of it. And so she told, she, she told me, okay, on Christmas, you get to see the toys that, you, that I bought you. You get to see all the things that I got you. But then we're taking them right back to the store. Oh, no. And she took me to the store and brought all the gifts back. Uh, and you were crying. Oh, yeah. But the worst <laughs> of it, the worst of it was that actually happened to me, I think, two or three years in a row. Mm. You think I learned after the first, the first year. Time, yeah. But <laughs> the second year, I had some really good friends of mine. And uh, actually, one of them is listening right now, so he probably remembers the story. But, uh, you know, I, I had some really good friends. And every year, roughly around Christmas time or my birthday or times like that, my parents would cook a lot of food and invite all my friends over and we could do, you know, whatever we wanted. And she would cook and, and provide for all these kids that would come to my house. I mean, and we're talking about like a good 10, 15 kids. Mm. And she would cook food for all of them. She would let us go to laser tag or whatever we wanted to do. But I, I did something roughly, I think it was my birthday. It wasn't Christmas that time. It was roughly around my birthday. I, I did something. And she said, okay, call your friends uh -huh. and tell them that they're not coming because you're grounded. <laughs> uh -huh. And it was bad enough that I was grounded. But when I had to call my friends and tell them why, and they got angry because they wanted to come over to my house. You know, mm -hmm. my mother was going to cook all that food. They would get to take some home. I mean, she would give them large plates of food to take home with them. Oh, so my, my friends, they felt like they were being punished mm -hmm. along with me mm -hmm. because of my attitude. <laughs> and they said, the next time you do such and such, whatever it was I did, I'm going to punch you in your face. <laughs> you know, I got, I got threatened. So, I mean, what, the point of me telling, me telling you these stories is that you have to be creative with your kids. Don't let them run the show. You run the show. That's your house. You're paying the mortgage. Yep. Amen. Amen. Well, on that thought, we are going to close for today. I think we had a good talk about parenting. And uh, God willing, hopefully this has been a blessing to all of you listening. Hope you join us again for Ever Present. Let us close with a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for these biblical principles and lessons, Lord, on parenting. Heavenly Father, that we learn as parents to model good behavior, not just in word, but in action, Heavenly Father, so that we learn to be an example and to show the young people what it is to reverence you and to worship you and to live for you. We pray, Lord God, for the young people in the church. We pray for them to stay in the church. We pray for parents and leaders and members of the church to help, Lord, to minister to the young people who are oftentimes forgotten in the church, for them to be ministered to, to be stimulated, and for their questions to be answered in the best possible way to thine honor and glory. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you and thank you again for joining us. Join us again for Ever Present.